So we're going to have a look at Acts 6, from verse 1 to verse 4. I'm reading from the New King James. It says, Now in those days, when the number of the disciples was multiplying, there arose a complaint against the Hebrews by the Hellenists, because their widows were neglected in the daily distribution. Then the twelve summoned the multitude of disciples and said, It's not desirable that we should leave the word of God and serve tables. Therefore, brethren, seek out from among you seven men of good reputation, full of the Holy Spirit, whom we may appoint over this business, that we may, but, but we will give ourselves continually to prayer and to the ministry of the word. Amen. Just bear with me a second. I'll get something I love that verse. It says, we will give ourselves continually to prayer and to the ministry of the word. Um, we have been journeying this last few nights uh, through the word of God and having some incredible people that have come to just release uh, things that have just been so stirring. And uh, God has led us as a ministry to be called prayer storm for a reason. Uh, I remember where I was stood several years ago, because this ministry started uh, back in 2009, believe it or not. Uh, so it's been a long time, May 2009. I remember where I was stood when I asked the Lord, because we're having all these weekly prayer meetings, there's about three or so going on across the city. And I was asking the Lord, Lord, what do we call these meetings? And I remember where I was stood again, when he gave me the name Prayer Storm. And uh, I'd Honestly, I'd never thought of that name until it came to me, and I knew it was the Lord because it was just too good. <laughs> I was like, oh, goodness me, I love that prayer storm. Now, what I didn't realize was there's a movement in America called The Call. How many have heard of The Call with Luengo? So um, I got to connect with Luengo, and Luengo is now a spiritual father, and it's been a voice of just uh, uh, intercession and revival, uh, and he's a man of fasting and prayer. Now, uh, when I got connected to Lou, I realized that uh, the call, well, actually, I knew this before I got connected to Lou, but I found out some more information that really stirred my heart about this name, Prayer Storm. So the call started in the year 2000, and uh, 400,000 people gathered to fast and pray for 12 hours. <laughs> Did you hear what I said? <laughs> Mostly young adults, 12 hours. 400,000. And so that gathering was, uh, I believe it was somewhere in September of 2000. Now, prior to that gathering, there were several meetings that went on to mobilize for prayer. Now, I'll come to those meetings in a moment. Now, in the year 2007, 7th of July 2007, I was in America, in Nashville, Tennessee, in a stadium. It was packed full of about 77,000 young adults, young people in this stadium, okay? And this was marking the end of a 40-day fast. And I went on this fast myself. I did a Daniel fast, and that fast was very significant for my life. Now, while I was in that stadium, that meeting, by the way, is also the call. It was another call gathering in a stadium, 12 hours of fasting and prayer, you know, and it was just incredible. While I was in that stadium was where I heard for the first time the Lord speak to me and say, James, you're going to mobilize like this for prayer in the UK. Now, it was, the, it was the furthest thing to my mind. In all honesty, I haven't seen that level of mobilization yet, but I know it will happen. And when the Lord said, you mobilize like this for prayer in the UK, when I think of this that the Lord referred to, it is fasting and prayer on mass. So in the UK, we've seen lots of movements that I have great relationships with as well that have risen up in prayer. But what we haven't quite seen yet is the deadly atomic explosive combination of fasting plus prayer en masse. <laughs> Are you hearing me? That combination, I believe, by the body of Christ in the United Kingdom, coming together with that kind of heart to seek God, seek his face, seek his heart, those kind of movements cause rumblings in the spirit that cause breakthroughs in the heavens. 
that cannot be achieved by single churches or single individuals. There, there's something of a collective corporate sound that would unlock certain things in the heavens. And when you add fasting and prayer on mass, the enemy is scared of the effects of those sorts of movements. He's really scared. And so sometimes the enemy doesn't mind that we gather together to pray. I hope you realize that. Acts 16, Paul and uh, someone. <laughs> Was it Paul and no, I know they were silent. Paul, you think? Anyway, Paul and his companion, they were on their way to prayer. And then the slave girl started saying stuff like, these are the servants. How many of you know this story? Do you know she said it for many days? But she didn't say it by the Holy Spirit. So she was saying it by another spirit. And she said she followed them. You know what that means? She also followed them to the prayer meeting. <laughs> so you want to tell me that people operating by demonic spirits can be in prayer meetings? Yes. Some of them can even be leading the prayer meeting. Uh-oh. Because I don't know why, but prophetic and prayer, sometimes they can attract, the, they, we tend to attract the weirdos. <laughs> I don't know why, it's just the way it is. And I'm not trying to be horrible to you and call you a weirdo, but sorry, you are. <laughs> to a certain degree, we have an inkling in us for the prophetic and the move of God. And sometimes it just attracts, you know, when you have the light, it, it attracts all kinds of insects sometimes. And the prophetic also does that. So you have to know what the real thing is. So that you don't, you don't get deceived by counterfeit that sounds like the real thing, looks like the real thing, but guess what? It's not the real thing. Because that slave girl was prophesying accurately. There was nothing she said that you could fault. Do you think that's not happening today in the church? It is happening. But many of us are not discerning because we've idolized spiritual gifts. And so we think because someone can prophesy accurately, it means it's by the Spirit of God. No, because there's a counterfeit of prophecy, suit saying. And it's going to increase in these last days. I don't know how I ended up on that tangent. However, <laughs> the call, 77,000 people gathered in this stadium. And the Lord said to me, you mobilize like this for prayer in the UK. And so that marked me, even though, one, it wasn't an ambition, but it, it, a seed was planted in my heart. Then I came back to the UK in 2009. The Lord, I was in my room. And I said, Lord, what do we call these prayer meetings? We're about to have a citywide young people prayer meeting. And he gave me the name Prayer Storm. Well, that's 2009. Fast forward a few years later, I get to meet Lou Engel. And this is what Lou Engel tells me, that the call, remember the call, started in the year 2000, where 400,000 people gathered. That call was preceded by a series of prayer meetings. Someone say prayer meetings. That happened across America. And those prayer meetings were called prayer storm. Are you, are you tracking with me now? Yeah. So prayer storm in America gave birth to the call, 400,000. And I was in one of their gatherings, 77,000 people. And I'm at the call and the Lord says to me, you mobilize like this for prayer in the UK. And I'm in my room saying, Lord, what do we call this prayer movement? And he gave me the same name. That that movement was called and I had no idea about it. So I'm here to announce to you, there is going to be mass mobilization across the United Kingdom. Like we have never seen before of fasting, of prayer, of consecration on mass. It is coming. And even though we've been doing this for many years, these are the early days. And when you see this begin to happen, take note. Because there's about to be the greatest explosion of the Spirit of God, the United Kingdom of everything. Because we know that every great move of God is preceded by a great move of prayer. So it's coming, people. This prayer storm is almost on the same prophetic journey as the prayer storms in America. That just like those ones led to mass mobilizations, these ones are going to lead to that too. Yes. However, in God's timing, God is going to take us step by step. And so we're going to see the mobilization of the body of Christ on a scale we have never seen before. Now, you might be saying, how does that connect to these verses? Well, this is really interesting because we start reading Acts 6. And there's a few things we need to kind of put in context here. 
the church is growing. And who's causing the growth? It's God. So as God is causing the church to grow, oh gosh, I just had another revelation. You need to realize this. There's a difference between God causing the church to grow and your gifting and your communication skills or your administrative skills and your advertising skills drawing people to the church. In the day and age we live in right now, as I go across the internet, like many of you do on YouTube and Facebook, and we have the greatest preachers, the greatest communicators, it seems to me, without knocking them, because I'm one of them too, in a sense, that our generation is gravitating towards giftings, communication skills, and not realizing we can fall in love with giftings. And people's ability to, you know, the gift of the gab. People's ability to speak and talk and get your stirred. Motivation, like one of my friends says, motivation is like a hot bath. It eventually gets cold. Jesus never preached a motivational message. Read through the Bible. It wasn't about that. It was, it was about preaching some messages that hurt the flesh. And he even called it good news. So he thinks hurting the flesh and dying to self is good news. It's part of the gospel. We better reclaim that aspect of the gospel. So in this generation, people are gravitating towards these nice messages and these things that make you feel good in the moment. Those kind of messages will not build an army. Those kind of messages that just make you feel good for now, when things get difficult, and when you pray for someone and they die of cancer, that you prayed for God to heal and it didn't happen, or when you've been contending for breakthrough and it didn't happen, and all these things are going on in your life, and you can't find a way to make sense of it, I'm telling you, what's going to keep you going is something deeper than a motivational message. It's a deeper revelation that you have of God by yourself. And God is wanting to raise up an army that doesn't back out. So in our generation, we have people that are able to draw a crowd by their giftings. It doesn't mean that God is the one growing the church. If your giftings have drawn them in, then you're going to have to keep them by your giftings. If your administrative mobilization, natural skills has drawn them in, then you're going to have to keep them by that. But this church was being multiplied by a supernatural force. Now look at what it says in Acts 1. It says, now in those days, when the numbers of the disciples was multiplying. Now, to understand the context, we have to read a few verses back. What it says is, now in those days. Everyone say, in those days. So we need to ask ourselves, what days was Luke, because Luke wrote the uh, book of Acts. What days is he referring to? So we need to actually put ourselves in the context. So he's saying in those days, God was multiplying the disciples. So I think it's good we kind of examine the environment that God used for multiplication. Because many of us today, we want God to grow our ministries. We want God to grow our churches. We want a move of God. But when you truly break down what happened in Acts 5, which we're going to try to do briefly, you see the context in which God brought multiplication does not equate to the context in which we are right now in the 21st century church and the way we cry for church growth. And the way we cry for God to increase and do more of what he wants to do. Oh God, we want your glory. Well, when we look through these verses, next time you're about to pray that prayer, you might want to think again. <laughs> and this is why. So go to Acts 5. Acts 5, it says, Acts 5 verse 5 says, Actually, you know what? Let me just go. Let, let, let me not go to verse 5. Let me go to Acts 5, 9. Acts 5, verse 9. Then Peter said to her, How is it that you have agreed together to test the Spirit of the Lord? Look, the, look, the feet of those who have buried your husband are at the door, and they will carry you out. Verse 10. Acts 5, verse 10. Then immediately... She fell down at his feet and breathed her last. And the young men came in and found her dead and carrying her out, buried her by her husband. 
Now, I don't know when the last time you heard this preached in church. <laughs> Imagine you go to church on a Sunday morning and the pastor gets up and says, okay, guys, today we're going to just say a prayer for the families of Ananias and Sapphira who died last Sunday when they lied in church to God. <laughs> so, for those of you that don't know the context, we're not going to go into the depth of the whole story, but these guys that died, so a husband and wife died because they lied. So, this is in the New Testament. For those of you that think God was mad in the Old Testament and is happy in the New Testament, he's the same yesterday, today, and forever. He actually doesn't change. His nature, he... Uh, when he introduces himself, he is a God of abound, he's abounding in love and mercy. That is who he is. But there are aspects of his nature that we have little revelation about. So here, they lied and they died. Fast forward, Acts 5, 16. Also, a multitude gathered from the surrounding cities to Jerusalem, bringing the sick and those who were tormented by unclean spirits. Listen to these next words. And they were all healed. Did you hear what I just said? Everyone said they were all. It didn't say two people got healed. It didn't say 10% of the people that came got healed. What did it say? They were Okay, I don't know about you. How many of you have been in meetings where every single person got healed? Hands up, anyone? One person. <laughs> Lay hands on me at the end of the meeting. <laughs> I haven't yet been in a meeting where, there were, even for those that may have tasted of that, we can all say, this is not something we see on a regular basis. They were all healed. Now, how many of you want to see all healed? My hand's up too. They were all healed. That's incredible. Now let's fast forward again to Acts 5 verse 41. It says, So they departed from the presence of the council, rejoicing that they were counted worthy to suffer shame for his name. In fact, let's just go back to verse 40. Acts 5 40. And they agreed with him and though... Let me read that again. And they agreed with him. And when they had called for the apostles, listen to this, and beaten them, they commanded that they should not speak in the name of Jesus. And then they let them go. Verse 41. So they departed from the presence of the council. This is crazy. After they'd been beaten, they departed rejoicing. That they were counted worthy to suffer shame for his name. Now, after that verse, we then go into chapter 6. He says, now in those days. Now, do you understand the days that Acts 6 one is talking about now? It's talking about the days when people died for lying. It's talking about the days when all were healed. It's talking about the days when they were beaten with rods, put in prison, and they rejoiced that they were suffering for God. In those days, God was multiplying the church. Do, do you understand how that doesn't make any sense? Because the fact that people are joining the church, because in fact, if you read the context, it says great fear fell upon the people. But yet, the church was multiplying. So, the means by which the church was multiplying was because it was God that was adding to the church. Why was God adding and multiplying the church? Because the church was built according to a certain pattern. The pattern that could carry his glory. And we want the glory of God. And we want more of the move of God in our lives and the nations of the earth. But we need to understand that with the increase of the glory comes an increase of responsibility and an increase in our favorite word, judgment. You can't have all healed and keep lying. You can't have 
all healed and not be ready to be beaten. You can't have all healed. You just want to look good and have a nice following on Facebook, but somehow you're ashamed about the fact that your belief system and how you believe the scriptures is in total opposition to the current culture. So you're scared to be on BBC and Sky News because they're going to mock you. You're scared about the culture. Yeah, you want all to be healed. These guys were a countercultural resistance to the decline of their day. And they did not buckle under the pressure. Amen. Today, the, the, the political correctness, the opposition is increasing. And guys, it's not going to stop increasing. It's going to keep getting more difficult to stand on the truth of the scriptures. But if we're people that are still scared, we're not really ready for this glory. If we're people that are still in compromise... We're not ready for the explosion that we want to see God release in the church. Because that glory is so intense that God is not going to release it until he's truly seen the people that are ready to carry it. So, you know, when we're, when we're saying, God, release your glory, God, move, God, do this. Sometimes he's like, I want to do that, but I can't. Because if I were to do that right now, half of you would be dead. You've come on the platform, you're preaching, but you're lying. You come on the platform, you're singing, but you've been sleeping around. You come on the platform, you, in fact, you're sitting right there, and you've been backbiting and speaking all these horrible words against your pastor. But yet, you sit down there, and you smile, and you act like everything is awesome. You're living a double life. You're saying one thing to God in the congregation, but your heart is in a totally different place. You think the glory is going to come and not deal with that? And when we're crying out for the move of God, one of the key things it tends to do is it starts to realign us. The reason why the early church was being multiplied in such difficult circumstances is because they had followed the ancient paths of God. And those ancient paths included a life of prayer, a life of fasting, a life of holiness. They couldn't... They couldn't shift from that lifestyle. And if they shifted from that lifestyle, listen, they could have shifted from that lifestyle and the ministry could still keep growing, but the growth that the ministry will be having will be based on the giftings of the people in the ministry, not the adding and the multiplying of the Lord. Are you tracking with me? Because the pattern in which they chose to build the ministry was countercultural. So it was only God that could grow them. Listen, if you're in ministry and your ministry is experiencing growth, and the ancient landmarks of fasting and prayer and holiness are not at the foundation of your personal life and ministry. The growth you're experiencing is being sponsored by something else apart from the Holy Spirit. And eventually, what you're calling growth, when it goes through the fiery eyes of Jesus, is going to be burned to ashes. So you have reason right now to make sure whatever growth you're after is according to the patterns of God. Because I can disconnect from prayer. I can disconnect from fasting. I go, you know what? It's not my kind of thing. And by the way, I need to make this clear. If I stop praying and I stop fasting, it doesn't mean God loves me less. Because some people think we're praying and fasting to earn something from God. Listen, you need to hear this loud and clear. If you leave this place and you decide, I'm never going to pray again. I'm never going to fast. You know, it's not my kind of thing. That's it. Listen, God still loves you. God does not stop loving you because you stop fasting and because you stop praying. The love of God is consistent and constant and never changing. However, your quality of experience of that love and how it changes you so you can reflect him is going to change. Because for you to love him says, if you love me, you will obey. It didn't say if you love me, you would cry during the worship. Oh, I love you, Jesus. <laughs> That's awesome. However, that's not proof of love. It is obedience. It is the lifestyle that's aligned with heaven. 
And so God is wanting to build a company of believers that are aligned in a certain lifestyle, that, have, that are building a life in a way that is according to the patterns of heaven. And as countercultural as it may seem, God wants to bring growth to such movements. So if you're here today, maybe you're a pastor, you're a leader, I don't want you to get distracted by all the latest church growth ideas and organizational, you know, leadership stuff that, you know, and see, there's nothing necessarily wrong with that, so, but some people just obsess over these areas and the foundational areas that God is actually looking to build upon are so non-existent. Um, I was reading earlier on how uh, Paul got saved. He encountered the Lord. And, you know, you know the story. When Paul had this encounter, he saw this bright light and he went blind. And you know what the scriptures say? He went blind and then he went three days. After that blindness, he went three days without food. This was... So, this is actually what happened. He got struck. He had this encounter of God he went blind, he, and he went into isolation, but he was actually seeking God in that time for those three days. So his spiritual journey started with three days of fasting. <laughs> now, I've been to a lot of Christian events, a lot of gatherings, and sometimes I wonder whether when people respond to Jesus in our meetings, okay, the atmosphere in which they are saved in ends up regulating how they live as a believer. So when we look across the church and it's lukewarm, and people say, I want to receive Jesus, and even the evangelist leading the prayer is in compromise. And people, I want to receive Jesus. The people receiving, they are being saved into what? A lukewarm environment, and that becomes their normal. So when they see people like us going on crazy, like, oh, those guys are abnormal. No, no, no. You're the one that's abnormal. <laughs> this is the normal Christianity. Fasting, prayer, holiness, intense after God. So we can't buy into a wrong ideology of what it means to give God everything and what it means to serve God. And God is wanting to recalibrate the church. He's wanting us to be a people that can carry the weight of his glory. Now, let's keep reading. It says, they were multiplying, and then there arose a complaint. There arose some kind of, you know, tension in the church. This tension was a secondary consequence of growth. Growth that God brought. Do you know what this means? Sometimes, sometimes, the worst thing that can happen to a ministry is growth. Or the worst thing that can happen to a business that wants to honor God can be growth. Because sometimes that very growth can become a hindrance to aligning fully with the Lord. Because God was multiplying them. And because of that multiplication, numbers of people increasing, which meant the administrative load was increasing. So the enemy was going to take advantage of this moment. And his temptation for the apostles was to shift from ministration to administration. Is anyone alive here today? Was to shift from ministration to admin. Now, it's not that administration is wrong because the move of God without the gift of administration will not reach its full potential. Because there's a, there's a truly, there's a gift of administration that's needed in the body of Christ to steward the move of God. And what I'm trying to say to you is there is a temptation, there is a tension that comes when we're crying out for the move of God, we don't realize we are in a vulnerable place. Because the very move we're crying out for can often become the thing that distracts us from God himself. So the apostles could see the shift coming. They could see that the growth of the ministry was going to start to put a load on them. 
And it was God that had brought the growth, but they were being shifted to a place where their energy was going to be invested in the wrong areas. So they decided they needed to make a shift. And the shift is the shift I believe God's calling us to today. It's in Acts 6.4. It says, But we will give ourselves continually. We will give ourselves continually. So there is a dimension of choice. There is a dimension of priority. See, you don't become a person of prayer just because you listen to a message on prayer. You don't become a person of prayer just because you're around an atmosphere where people pray. You have to make a conscious decision to do this, to give yourself. The process of giving yourself means you push past resistance. Giving yourself, it's not something that feels nice to your flesh. So when we come here and we're like, we're going to pray, we're going to press in. The true warriors do not need to be wound up. The true warriors, because they've been giving themselves and giving themselves, it's just natural for them to push deep. So if I were to come to your church prayer meeting, by the way, it's been said, you go to church on a Sunday morning, you find how popular the church is. Sunday evening, how popular the pastor is. Prayer meeting day, how popular God is. It's obviously clear in the West that in our church prayer meetings, God is not that popular. And even the meetings where people are gathering, a lot of the times, the pastor, whoever is leading, has to wind people up. Come on, come on, come on, let's pray. Or everyone is having a chat about football. Everyone's excited. And they say, let's pray. Silence. <laughs> Your church is probably one of the ones that, that I, I, I was the pioneer in a new culture. So we will come to your church. Those are the guys from Derby, right? I've heard about your prayer meetings. Amazing. But you've got to realize, for the great majority, that is not normal. But that's what God wants to do. People are talking about football, talking about cartoons, talking about movies, all excited, talking about parties, talking about weddings. And then someone says, let's pray. You know what happens? Silence. In fact, this tends to happen a lot. Some people start to yawn. Have you noticed that? Try it. Get with your family and everyone's talking and say, let's pray. One or two people are probably going to start to yawn. Why were they not yawning when we're talking about football and movies and the party? Think about it. Why? Because the flesh is putting up its resistance. So you have to get used to shutting the flesh down. You don't give yourself just because, you know, you raise your hand and say, yes, Lord, I want to do this. You give yourself by getting into the habit, into the culture of discipline in your flesh. And so what this looks like is you are going to have your personal time of prayer. Lord, I want to pray. I want to, I want to spend 30 minutes. I want to spend an hour in your presence. I want to go deeper. Okay? And as you start, you pray, you pray, you pray all the prayers you know to pray. And you think you've prayed for an hour. You look at the time and you've prayed for five minutes. You know what? That is your flesh. And the quicker you identify it, the quicker you recognize what's going on, the better it is for you to know, actually, this is just my flesh kicking against me. But I am going to give myself. I am going to push past the resistance. The apostles, ha they could have been uh, uh, distracted or they could have given themselves to the administrative responsibilities of managing the growth they could have I know that pressure and if you're a leader in this place or you lead any kind of team or ministry or anything you know the pressure of there's so much that's been required of you you can give yourself to you know to meeting after meeting to this after but you see this is the crazy thing you can have a growing ministry to the masses and a shrinking heart towards God and nobody will know it. But you know the iron? Today I had to iron something. And uh, the iron gets really hot. Doesn't it? If you don't believe me, try to touch the iron when you plug in. Then you know the iron gets... How many know what I'm talking about? 
You all know what iron is, right? When an iron is really, really hot, okay, and you're ironing, and you unplug it, the heat doesn't immediately go away, does it? Even though you've unplugged it, you can still be using it to iron. You know that's how many people die spiritually? Because they've unplugged. They've stopped giving themselves. And they're now surviving on the afterglow or the leftover heat, which is gradually dwindling. But if we're going to be people that would carry and sustain this move of God, I believe we're going to be people that would have to give ourselves in a whole new way. Now, when you start to give yourself, oftentimes people around you that have settled in a life of lukewarmness will try to discourage you. And they will say things like, why are you doing all this intense prayer? Just chill out. The victory has already been won. <laughs> Jesus said it is finished. You don't need to, you need to pray for five hours. It's already done. Just, just rest. Now, there is an element of truth, but the theology by itself, without taking the whole counsel of scripture, will end you up in a place of shipwreck. Because the apostles gave themselves after Jesus said it is finished. So were they trying to earn something? No. See, God loves us, but it doesn't mean he always trusts us. The process of giving ourselves opens us up to the dealings of God, which causes us to step into places of maturity, which means he can now begin to entrust us with spiritual responsibilities. So if God is going to give us the body of Christ greater responsibility, he's going to have to test us. And to test us, we're going to have to go through a lot of dying. Even Jesus had to go through. So if Jesus had to go through a lot of tests and trials, and then he came out of the wilderness feel, uh, you know, in the power of the Holy Spirit, who are you to think that you know, it's just going to be an easy ride? I want to encourage someone here today that feels like Christianity is just so difficult. Well, it's difficult until you fall in love again with God. Amen. Because his love empowers everything else. In the flesh, it's impossible for you to do this. But by his spirit, you agree with his spirit, you can do this. However, it's going to hurt. I'm not going to lie to you and tell you it's going to be easy. It is the process of obeying the Lord is actually quite difficult to, on the flesh. And this is where God is going to build his end time warriors. So when you decide you're going to give yourself, your flesh is going to try to fight and then the enemy is going to stir up some people who have settled and compromised around you to tell you to chill out. So you know what I tend to say to people like that? Hey, if you can assure me that on the day of judgment, your words are going to make a difference when I stand before him, then I'll listen to you. Now, you can't assure me that your words will make any difference. When I stand to give an account, by the way, people think, oh yeah, you know, I'm saved and, you know, I'm not going to hell, I'm going to heaven and that's it. Do you realize there's another judgment? Okay, if you don't, this is not the lesson, this is not the session to teach that, but you need to understand that there is going to be a judgment where his eyes are going to test the works of you and me, the believers. And some people are going to go through that judgment and they're going to come out on the other side and everything they think they've done for God is going to be ashes. You have the wood, the hay, and the stubble. You have the gold, the silver, and the precious stones. And these are categories of works. Your works will be... But when I say your works, it doesn't mean that you have to be on a platform like me. Because God is going to judge you based on the calling he had for you when he created you. 
And your calling may not have been a platform like this. Your calling could have been a full-time mom. Your calling could have been a nurse. Your, whatever, a businesswoman, a businessman. It, it's not really, you know, what it is. It's about your obedience, your compliance, your submission to his process. In fulfilling his calling on your life, he's going to judge that. So we are all going to give an account. So it's possible for God to have a purpose for me where in that purpose, I am a leading a mass mobilization of an army. Tens of thousands and, and millions gathering to fast and pray. It's possible that that is in God's calling for my life. But you realize if I don't submit to God's process, I will not step into the fullness of that calling. Because the process is designed to... to to deal with me and get rid of the excesses. Are, are you with me? Yes. If you don't realize that you have excesses, there are things that God is dealing with you right now. And you may think, God, why am I going through this? And what is this all about? Could it be that God is just trying to get rid of some stuff, some mindsets, some dispositions? Because where he's taking you, that mindset cannot survive. And you are so big on wanting to get to the end result. But you don't realize God is actually so keen on that process of making you into everything it's called to be. Listen, it takes time for God to make a person. And so you want to give yourself and your neighbor is going to say, you know, just chill out, you know. You don't, need to, you don't need to intensify this. First off, you need to understand. People use these words. Oh, you're striving. You're just striving. Why don't you say that to Jesus? After the father said, I love you, you're my beloved son, then he went to the desert and is fasting and is praying. You can, you can say to Jesus, you're, you're striving. It seems to me like many Christians use the word striving on anything they think it's requiring effort in the things of God. You're striving. So they just think we're just supposed to just sit there and do nothing. No. Yes, in a sense, we're not. Jesus was not in the desert fasting trying to earn God's love. Because he knew he was loved, that love empowered his obedience and his spiritual activity of fasting and prayer. So he was fasting from love, not fasting for. That subtle shift, I believe, is what striving is about. He wasn't striving, trying to earn something that he did not already have. He was just aligning himself from the place of what the Lord had already given him. And so his, his process of fasting and prayer was allowing the Lord to align him more fully so that God could express himself through Jesus and the flesh would not get in the way. So he is the express image of the invisible God. God is shining through Jesus. And do you know Jesus had flesh too? Are you with me? Is anyone with me today? Jesus had flesh. And his flesh also wanted to do some things that the Father didn't want him to do. That's why he says, not my will. <laughs> right? That's why the enemy came and tempted him and said, if you are the Son of God, do this. So there was a possibility for him to do something apart from the will of God. So he had a flesh. In the same way, we have the flesh alive and well today. And God is taking us through the process. However, he wants us to give ourselves to the ministry of prayer and the word. These two things, the ministry of prayer and the word, I believe are critical for what the Lord wants to release over us as individuals and over the body of Christ. I often say this, and I'll keep saying it. We cannot be an army if you are not a soldier. We want a move of God, then each of us would have to learn how to push. We want a move of God, then each of us would have to have spiritual stamina. But oftentimes in our gatherings, you can tell the stamina is quite weak. Because people are not used to pushing deep. But I believe God is going to start to change the culture in the church. 
where what we are doing here that looks crazy will become the new norm. When you go to your church for your prayer meeting, you don't have to come to prayer storm, but your church has a storm when you get together to pray. Because it's not like, oh yeah, it's a Nigerian thing, oh yeah, it's a South Korean thing, or Korean, you know, Korean prayer. No, 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 it's a kingdom thing. This is how they prayed in the New Testament. They were intense. They gave themselves. Now notice the order in a roundup right now. Notice the order. It says, we will give ourselves to prayer and the ministry of the word. So in essence, when they were not preaching, guess what they were doing? So you can never pray too much. I don't know how much you think you're praying right now, but part of our calling as a ministry is to empower you, is to be a catalyst in your prayer life to shift to a new level. Because there is still more we can give. There is still more we can surrender. There is still more that God can stir up in us. And this is not the time for a casual approach to prayer. Can I get the band up, please? This is not the time for a casual approach. We want a move of God. But he starts in here as we align ourselves with him. As we align ourselves with his process. And let the naysayers and let those people come and say, oh yeah, you guys are striving. You guys are just, you know, you're overdoing this. Listen, this is the way of the kingdom. We are going to give ourselves to a life of prayer and ministry of the word.